Hello, my name's Eric Paddock. I'm the curator of photography here at the Denver Art Museum, and it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here uh, for our lecture this evening. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, we are sold out. Um, there's some unoccupied seats, but we're going to keep the money. Um, <laughs> but there may be some stragglers, so if, if some of you in the back row could do me a huge favor, I'd really appreciate it if you could kind of squinch towards the middle so any late arrivals won't have to uh, be shuffling around and uh, crossing into the centers of rows and stuff like that uh, once the talk's underway. Could you do that for me, please? Thank you. All right. Um, first of all, I have many people to thank, uh, beginning with tonight's speaker, Dwayne Michaels, who has come all the way from New York City to talk to us tonight. I'd also like to thank Evan and Elizabeth Anderman, who have pledged a very generous uh, support for an ongoing photography lecture series uh, that we're kicking off this spring and will uh, pick up again in earnest uh, sometime late summer or early fall of 2013. That is later this year. I want to thank the University of Denver, especially Roddy McInnes in the Department of Art and Art History, who is really responsible for bringing Dwayne Michaels here uh, this week and we uh, really appreciate your thinking of that, okay? And then finally, I want to thank uh, uh, the Colorado Photographic Arts Center and its director, Rupert Jenkins, and all of you for coming tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, before we get into the, the main feature here, I do have a few announcements that I need to make. Uh, we already talked about this being a full house, um, fire code, uh, limits the number of people that we have in the building, and I really hope there will be no rioting in the auditorium during the course of the evening. Uh, cell phones, forget about it. You're in the basement of a titanium building. This is like a gigantic Faraday cage. They don't work, but I'd really appreciate it if you didn't put that to the test and switched your phones uh, to silent. Of course, if you want to save battery life, you would switch them off altogether so that they're not hunting for a connection for the next hour or so. Our next lecture by the noted and extremely interesting Navajo photographer, uh, Will Wilson, will be given at 6.30 p.m. That's 6.30, not 7 o'clock p.m. on Thursday, March 28th, here in the uh, Sharp Auditorium. And I invite you all to come to that lecture. I also urge you to visit Will who will be setting up a tintype studio in the Native Arts Visiting Artists Studio on the third floor of the North Building. He will be here, uh, uh-oh, huh, you would ask. Um, I think he's setting up the studio on the 24th of uh, March and will be working in the studio for a, a week or 10 days after that. And then beginning uh, the following week on the, uh, uh, whatever that is, 28, 30, uh, the 29th, I'm sorry, the night after the lecture, we will be opening a pop-up exhibition of Will Wilson's photographs in the Anthony and Delisa Mayer Photography Gallery on the seventh floor of the North Building. Those pictures are going to be really interesting, and they're only going to be up for one week. So uh, come on by and have a look at those if you get a chance. All right, what else? Okay, uh, last announcement is that if I ever stop talking, uh, we will have time for some questions and answers at the end of uh, Dwayne Michaels' uh, talk this evening. And I ask that you raise your hands and wait. Uh, we'll have, um, uh, I don't know, Vanna White. We'll have a couple of people in the aisles here with microphones, and we ask that you wait until they pass the cordless microphone to you before you start speaking. Uh, there are a couple advantages to that. One is that everyone else in the room can actually hear what you're saying. And uh, I think that lends itself to a sort of a better conversation after the talk. The other reason is that we are videotaping this. And uh, if, if this could be your moment. <laughs> but even if it's not, um, for educational purposes and for the uh, enjoyment of the people who watch that video in the years to come, we'd really appreciate being able to hear your voices and hear your questions, okay? All right, 
So it's my pleasure and my privilege to introduce Dwayne Michaels. Dwayne is a distinguished and a uh, distinguished member of DU, DU's class of 1953, whose work has had a profound impact on the evolution of photography uh, from over the last 50 years. A major retrospective of his work will open at the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh next year, and we all look forward to seeing that exhibition and owning a copy of the catalog. For one thing, it demonstrates the breadth and depth of Duane's work over many years and introduces photographs that none of us has seen before, except maybe Duane, right? Oh, he hasn't seen him yet either. Um, I was thinking about how to introduce Duane Michaels, and I realized that uh, maybe the easiest thing is just to talk about my first impression when I first saw his work as a freshman in college uh, some time ago. When I first saw the pictures, I was, I was really fascinated for several different reasons. For one thing, it wasn't just a single image. These were series of pictures often, and they had some kind of cumulative meaning, and he wrote on them, and they were not necessarily found. They were staged. They were created, and in some cases, they involved props. Uh, there's a picture in this rotation coming up somewhere, and we'll probably see it later, that involves a model of a bathroom and realizing that those things were made by hand for purposes of making pictures was really just a wonderful surprise to me. And over time, I think what I learned from those pictures is that uh, there are many different ways to make photographs, and photographs create narratives or tell stories in a lot of different ways, and there's no single right or wrong way to do that. They're all potentially as fascinating as the pictures that Twain has made uh, in his lifetime. On the other hand, the pictures were funny. Some of them were perplexing. And that sometimes the stories didn't have a clear beginning, middle, and end because they kept looping back around on themselves and they were elliptical. And the more you looked at them, uh, the better you thought you understood what was going on, but also the more excited you got, the more excited you got, the more, uh, more excited I got the more I wondered if I was missing something. So I'm very glad that Dwayne's here tonight so he can fill me in on what I missed. Um, of course, as a curator, I'm sorry, but I can't help trying to place uh, Dwayne Michael's work into some kind of wider context. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, except to say that in the 19th century, photographers such as William Lake Price and Julia Margaret Cameron, and later in the century, Frank Holland Day, uh, constructed photographs that illustrated or told stories. The difference there is that often those pictures uh, were pictures that referred to works of literature, uh, things uh, Don Quixote by Cervantes or um, uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson's Idols of the King or the New Testament. Um, so that was followed, I think, in the early 20th century by pictorialist photographers who made, again, single images that attempted to suggest some kind of narrative or some kind of story. And often what they did is they chose kind of the pregnant moment in that story or the climax of the story in order to convey the whole thing. And what Duane did is he came along and he disarticulated that whole uh, uh, idea of a very restrictive and straightforward kind of photographic narrative and introduced us to something very new and very different. I think there are several contemporary photographers whose work uh, responds to uh, Duane's work in some way or another, and I don't want to stretch it too far, but I would say that uh, Gary uh, Trudeau and David Leventhal's book, Hitler Moves East from the 1970s, a lot of the work of Eileen Cowan, Leslie Crims, uh, even Cindy Sherman, have uh, some important and interesting relationship to Duane's work. But we're not really here to talk about all of that. I just will skip ahead for a bit. Um, and this isn't a history lesson. You all came here to see and to hear Duane Michaels, and I ask you to join me in welcoming him to Denver. Yeah, I do. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Um, 
could, could we put the lights on so I could see the people in the audience so I can make funny faces at them? I can't see them. Uh, anyway, uh, is this an intervention? <laughs> it's the drinking, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's the bald thing, right? You're gonna, no. It's very strange. Uh, suddenly I find myself 81. Woo. Uh, in my family, uh, almost everybody, everybody goes uh, 80, 85, 86, 87, which statistically gives me about five big ones left, which is a little bit scary, but I don't scare easily. Uh, you know, after listening to all that, I should have asked for more money. I had no <laughs> idea. I just had no idea that that stuff was going on, you know. I, I graduated in 1953. Can you imagine 60 years ago? I mean, I met a baby today, and the baby was only, uh, the baby hit on me. I, I have to talk about that. <laughs> but the thing about it is that the, that little girl will be, she could live to the year 21 something or other. You know, I mean, that's, I don't know why she would want to, but I think it's rather startling. <laughs> yeah. I want to tell you a little story. Um, uh, a man goes into a bar, and, uh, in the bar, there's this huge jar filled with $100 bills. And uh, he said, wow, there's got to be $10,000 in that jar. So he said to the bartender, uh, what's with this jar? And he said, well, you, there are three things you must do. You put $100 in the jar. And if you could perform all three chores, uh, you get the contents of the jar. So he said, oh, wonderful. Well, what do I have to do? And he said, well, first you've got to drink a gallon of scotch straight down without stopping. And second, in the backyard of the bar, there's a pit bull. And he has a very bad tooth and you have to remove the pit bull's tooth. And then above the bar on the third floor is a lady who's 97 and she's never had sex and you have to satisfy her. And he said, oh, no, no, forget it. But then he has a few drinks he says, what the hell? So he puts the $100 in there, he drinks the scotch, straight down, uh, no problem. And then he goes in the backyard and you hear this barking and growling and, and he comes in and he's got bites on it and his hair's all bloody and his shirt's ripped. And he says, all right, now where's that old lady who needs her tooth removed? <laughs> Well, 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 you had to be there. <laughs> you know, it's very peculiar. I find everything to be, oh, first of all, I should tell you whom you're dealing with, okay? And, and first of all, I'm 81 years old. I'm gay. My friend, Fred and I have been together for 53 years, which is amazing. Uh, I was brought up a Catholic, but I'm a raging atheist. So any of these subjects may pop up at any time in my conversation. And since I'll never see you again in the, uh, in the entire history of Duane and insert your name here in the universe, uh, you know, put up with it. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I'm a little bit nervous with people who do know what's going on. Right now, ideas are popping into my head. I don't know what my next sentence is going to be. And I find this all very curious. Do you know that we live in a, a small piece of green dust floating around an ordinary plant, a star, that if you looked at us from the distance of the next star, you probably wouldn't even see us. In our galaxy, there are probably 30 or 50 billion stars. There are probably 50 to 60 billion galaxies. Right now, my bladder is filling up with water. I don't tell my bladder, no, it's piss. I don't tell my bladder what to do. Uh, right now, the, the, the synapses in my head are bouncing off of each other, telling me what to say. My eyes are reflecting this in some kind of, everything is amazing. Schools do not teach amazement. Somehow, we have to learn to be amazing. We have to understand how amazing we are because we're all whistling in the dark on this planet. None of us really, the Pope doesn't know, I call him the poop, doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> they really don't, nobody knows what's going on. And the people who really know what, the people who are so profound in there and holding on to their, uh, what do they call those, Tea Party beliefs, the people who are so firm, who cannot compromise, who are not open, they know the least of what's going on. So since I'm going to be dead in probably another five or six years, I want to know what's going on. And I don't know what's going on. But what I do know is this, I think, Therefore, I am. <laughs> I didn't write that. <laughs> anyway, no, but, but since all this stuff is happening, you see, this is my Duane suit. This is a 1932 model. I'm inside of here. You know, this is a 42 regular. I have never been regular. No, but this is, and watch, this is Duane alive, okay? Blah, 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 blah. Here's Duane dead. No, that's, what, look, you ever see dead, dead people? This is what they do. This is a plant alive. That's a plant dead. What's gone? The energy is gone. The Chinese call it the qi. The Japanese call it the ki. Uh, uh, Henri Bergson, the French philosopher, calls it the élan vital. And I call it the animating energy. It is the energy. 
that is everything that you're seeing. It's the energy in every plant, soon be a motion major spring. It's this stuff, it's this, and we are that energy. There's a, but you know, I'm an empiricist. I believe in only direct experience is the only true knowledge. You know, it's like reading 100 love stories, and then you, find, you finally fall in love. You, oh God, this is what they're really talking about. And you can't talk about it because you're in it. You're up to here in it. It's lovely. That, so nobody's done anything till you've done. And nobody's baked an apple pie till you've done. And nobody's gone to Paris till you've gone to Paris. Nobody's, it's actually in the doing. Now, there are those people who are bullshitters. They say things and they never do them. Well, I'm a doer. You get two choices in life. And you know what? It's interesting. Nobody gives a fuck. <laughs> the, universe doesn't, the universe doesn't even know we're here. You know? And if you don't care enough, and you don't have an audience, nobody cares what I do. Nobody cares. But you have to care enough. So I'm just saying, at any age, you can always get your act in gear. The, Stephen Sondheim, Gypsy, wrote a couple of interesting lyrics, which I always remembered. And he talked about, some people can be, con music is free. Some people can be content playing bingo and paying rent. And then he says, living life in the living room. So all, all I'm saying is, we're going to be out of here before you can say, my God, what was that? And so since you're here, especially young people, because you have more time, since you're here, check it out. Make mistakes. Get wounded. Fall in love. Get hurt. Write it down. It's all in the doing, you know. And I, I'm so thrilled because I don't know what I'm going to do next. And that's always the way, I really don't know what I'm going to do next. I've always taken chances. Given my socioeconomic background, I should be living in West Mifflin Township, Pennsylvania, be married, have three kids, still be a Catholic and be suicidal. But I went over the wall, you know. When I was in high school, I said to myself, self, I always talk to myself like that, <laughs> Mr. Self, what I'm, <laughs> anyway, self, I, I will go to New York, I will have great, a great friend, and I will have adventures. And that's what, exactly what I've done. And if you don't want to have adventures, that's fine. It doesn't, nobody gives a shit what you do. So have an adventure. Have a, so tonight is going to be your adventure. Whether you like it or not, you are in for it, right? Okay, now if you have any questions, I would love them. I, I really would. And the more intimate the questions and the more embarrassing, the more embarrassing and, and the intimate will be my answer. So let's, let's have some going, something happening, something touching. Because this is the moment. You, well, watch. See, this is now. We, 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 this is now, right? No, it's not, because this is actually now. <laughs> no, no, this is really now. That was not now. The minute you say now, there is. Have you ever paid attention? Oh, that's the great thing, paying attention. It's, see, photographers look, but they don't pay attention. They're looking, and they see what, exactly what they expect to see. Don't tell me what I know. Or don't tell me what snow looks like. Don't tell me what tits look like. Don't tell me what cars look like. Tell me what I don't know. And the only thing I don't know is what you know. And that's what artists should do. They should give me the secret. You should give the secret, your own secret. We have secrets. There are secrets you've never even told your lover. There are secrets we have in your poetry and your art and lies in your vulnerability. And your vulnerability lies in your secrets. And that's where you want to go. But first, you have to be courageous enough to say that. Now here's what you do. The Chinese say to walk around the world, you have to take a first step. Now if you want to learn, and you don't have to do this. I'm just putting this on the table. This, this is free. This is not extra. Okay? <laughs> We're running a tab. You're counting. I get what? A buck a word? <laughs> Who's Somebody's got to have the counter. Okay, here's what you do. You have a secret. Now, what if I had this secret and I wrote the secret down on a piece of paper? And I never told anybody this. And the secret is, I don't think my father loved me. Oh my God, how could you say that out loud? Oh my God. All right, I'll write that on a piece of paper. All right, and I'll put that paper under the drawer behind my underwear where I keep my dirty magazines <laughs> where nobody will ever look. And then maybe a month later, I have enough courage to write a second secret. And then the second sentence says, and I don't think I loved him. Oh my God, how could you say that? And that's what you do. You have the courage to say to yourself a secret. And you don't have to tell anybody. But what's important is you had the act. You, you took the gesture. You took the first step to walk around the world. And you said it out loud. And you liberated yourself in the process. And it doesn't matter if anybody ever read it. it who gives a shit what you wrote anyway? But you have to have enough. What's that? Like something, it's, I don't know what it is, but you have to have enough garbanzas. No, no, chutzpah. I don't know what chutzpah is. I got plenty of that. I don't need chutzpah. <laughs> you know, it's like 
It refers to men's testicles, like garbanzas. <laughs> what is it? Kahunas. Ah, surf's up. <laughs> well, that train left the station. All right. Well, we're going to. Don't forget questions. All right. Oh, oh, I've seen this. Where are the dirty pictures? Okay. Well, can we go now? Okay. Here we go. Oh, do I do something? Oh, there's. This says. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've, all right. It's called a little story. It's called Take One and See Mount Fujiyama. It was a very hot day. The book was dull. He was bored. You want, why don't you move over? You gonna, oh, someone slipped an envelope under the door. Oh, that's the second picture. Okay. Third picture. There was something peculiar written on it, and it says, Take one and see Mount Fujiyama. Inside were some pills, and without any hesitation, he gulped down a pill. He felt like a balloon with its air being let out. Instantly, he became six inches tall. The door squeaked as an enormous nude woman entered the room behind him. She grew larger as she approached his chair, and, he be and she began to tower over him. I have your attention, don't I? <laughs> yeah, you're really, yeah, you're looking now. She did not see him, and he was excited by her size. His excitement turned to terror when he realized that she was going to sit on his chair and on him. <laughs> I said, sit. As her colossal ass descended upon him, he tried to run, but was paralyzed. His tiny legs refused to move. He stood frozen with excitement as a gigantic ass settled down closer and closer. I hope there are no children here. <laughs> she sat on him. Miraculously, in the darkness, he began to see the snow-covered peak of Mount Fujiyama. <laughs> Well, you had to be there. <laughs> I did a little story called The Amazing Rick Dick, starring Richard Gere, Joel Gray, Cindy Crawford, and Aaron Taylor. Mr. Dick, let me introduce myself. My name is Richard Richards. He says it again. My name is Richard. He stuttered. <laughs> I want you to find out. Um, uh, my wife is having an affair cheating on me, and I want you to find out who her lover is. Here's a check for following my chick. Rick Dick follows Ramona Richards to a rundown hotel. Richard Richards follows Rick, who is following Ramona Richards. She enters room 109. Rick enters room 109 and finds Ramona in her lover's arms. Rick is shocked to discover that Ramona's lover is Nick Dick, Rick Dick's younger, reckless brother. <laughs> Rick hears a click. Richard Richards has followed uh, Rick to room 109. You dicks are dead ducks. Rick wrestles the revolver from Richard Richards. Ouch! Richard Richards hits his head on the chest. At that moment, Richard Richards is surprised to realize his true identity. He's not Richard Richards. He's actually Dick Dick, Rick Nick Dick, Nick Dick's missing older brother. Nick Dick and Rick Dick's missing older brother. <laughs> Ramona regrets her romance with Nick and photographs the three Dicks. Nick claims, and they're cojones, Nick claims he was just teaching Ramona a trick. Rick returns Dick's check to Dick, and Dick forg forgives Ramona and Nick. But um, I had to pay Richard Gary a million five. Uh, the whole thing cost me 17 million bucks, but luckily it was chump change. I work on Wall Street. <laughs> I went to Egypt and I built my own pyramid. If you notice, mine's bigger than theirs. I got a Barbie doll. A Barbie, I had never seen a Barbie doll. How do I know about Barbie? I thought a Barbie doll would be like a Cabbage Patch doll, you know. And uh, so they, they, they were doing a fundraiser for AIDS, and you got this Barbie doll, and you were supposed to do something with it. So the Barbie doll arrives. I open the package. I'm shocked because out steps, uh, it was, however, 12 inch high Las Vegas whore. I couldn't believe Barbie <laughs> was a whore. I mean, what do you call that? I mean, the blonde hair down to there, legs up to there. I was truly shocked. I expected it was going to be a, you know, like a cabbage patch doll, you know. You know, ah. But when you, when, never mind. <laughs> well, when you, with, 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 with this one, you're like, ah, you know, it's, it, you know, it goes, fuck me, fuck me. <laughs> so I did something called Barbie and the Toad. While wandering down the road, Barbie met a toad. I love to rhyme. I really do. I, I would make a fortune at, uh, 
Hallmark, if I have a second in career. Barbie met, wandering down the barman, I'll go backwards. She could, she could tell by the gleam in his eyes that he must be a prince of disguise. I would, you know, I, you know what, I, you just popped into my head. Things were always popping. But as I said, while wandering down the barbie meadow, she could tell the, by the size of his thighs that he must be a prince in disguise. Isn't that funny? I never thought of that before. <laughs> I guess if I give him a kiss, he will be free to marry me and I will become a princess, said the uh, uh, ambitious bitch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and with just one kiss, wait a while, Barbie could plainly see that the toad was indeed royalty. Yeah, unfortunately, he was evil Arnold, the satanic prince of darkness and warts. <laughs> oh, did, oh dear, said Barbie. Ouch! Eek! <laughs> then with one big Barbie burp, the evil prince became a toad again. Croak, croak, said the toad. I always wanted to be a blonde. <laughs> uh, I think that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, French Vogue used to do a December issue on a single subject, like Scorsese on film or Hockney on uh, drawing. So they did an issue on, on uh, quantum, and they asked me if I could illustrate quantum. And, and I'm very much interested in quantum. But you know, I've, oh, you know what's interesting? Uh, well, if you know what's interesting, tell me. What's interesting? No. What, uh, uh, here's what I wanted to say. Wait a while, I'm getting my head back together. The thing that's that why I'm different from other photographers and a lot of other people is that I have an enormous curiosity. I, I really do. I have a very big curiosity and I always want to know what's going on. And, um, and the other thing about photographs is photography f photographs duplicates reality with exquisite fidelity. There's nothing else can do it as well as it can. But it's mostly description. Photography describes mountains and trees and cars and ball heads. And I, I looked at you. That made me say it. Uh, the, at the, you should, I, I saw advertising space on. My, you know. Anyway, but see, I'm distracting myself. I've got to stop. Oh, before I remind me what I just said. But I wanted to tell you what's interesting. And then another interesting thing is pay attention to your mind. Most people don't even know they have a mind. They have no idea. And then what kind of a mind do you have? But you do. Everything you see, everything you feel, everything you think is in your mind. It's in your brain. You're upside down what you see. So, and so find out what kind of a mind you have. Some people have stupid minds, lazy minds. But I have a very interesting mind, he said, modestly. No, but what my mind, when I say something, I hear two or three spin-offs. You know, when I say like, uh, I'm a little horse. I think of Princess Anne. I think of Sea Biscuit. I have so when I make a statement like that last sentence, I, I hear two or three other, and I think that's where my creativity lies because I'm always dipping to that well, and it always just well. That you know who that was that was Jack Benny. But I'm always see my mind just said that. So I'm just telling you, you have a mind. You put shit in your mind, you're gonna have a shitty life. Nobody's the, you're the blame. Nobody makes you do that. Well, I just, what do you mean? Fuck you, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah. What? Huh? What? Huh? Yeah. Anyway, so they asked me to, oh, anyways, about description. Now, if you photograph something, that shows you what it looks like. But I want to know what it feels like. So if I see a woman crying, I want to know what grief, I did a book called Questions Without Answers, where I answered all these questions, what is grief? No, but it's that curiosity. And so nobody can give you that curiosity. So a photographer, if you photograph death, photographers will photograph the facts of death. Tombstones, tombstones, um, cemeteries, same place. Um, people crying, women in black, or else it's an art opening in New York. Um, <laughs> let's see what else. But uh, so. I found that I, you have to annotate the photograph. So because I, when I told my mother that I was going to be a photographer, she said, well, you never, you never went to photography school. But if I had gone, nothing personal, it would have been a disaster because I would have learned the photography rules, and it's very difficult to unlearn. I had to unlearn Catholicism. I had to learn that I wasn't a heterosexual. You have to learn all these things in this, in this trip you're on. This is a trip, and, you know, and it's going to have an ending. Anyway, I forgot where I was going with that, but it was interesting, wasn't it interesting? <laughs> yeah, okay. So, all right, so for, for in quantum, does anybody know who Heisenberg is? Oh, good. Uh, I'll tell you for you sitting on your hands. 
or holding hands or whatever you're holding. I'll go on to, uh, this is what it is. Uh, when I graduated from high school, and Mr. Dunlop, who was a really terrible teacher in chemistry, I learned that uh, uh, energy is transferred. It's not created or destroyed. It's, it's always transferred. It's a closed system. And so w we discovered then in those days that we had an electron, proton, and a neutron all doing this. And then they had larger colliders. Then they discovered quarks, and that comes from James Joyce. I'm very f I like James Joyce a lot. I don't love him. We only necked. But anyway, the other thing was that uh, uh, then we got muons and gluons. And then when you get to the very bottom with all these particles, there are thousands of particles, and they, they, they think they've discovered the bosom. Hicks, don't ask. I don't know what it is. But when you get down there, they're all doing this. And Heisenberg famously said that when you get to the basis of all this energy that creates the energy, it is, uh, you, can, you cannot predict with the velocity or the position of any particle. And uh, that prompted Einstein to say that, uh, uh, what did he say? He said, get out of here, bother me, kid. Get the camera out of my face. No, no, he said that he could not believe that God would play dice with the universe, although he Einstein was an atheist. So this is my Heisenberg's magic mirror of uncertainty. The Odette could never be sure with any certainty which reflections she sees of herself in the, in the mirror. The act of looking into the mirror affects what the image will be, which is pure quantum. Uncertainty permits the possibility of anything and everything, and that's wonderful. The possibility of everything and anything. And if you don't believe in the possibility of something, it'll never happen. If you have to believe, the buck doesn't end here, it starts here. I would still be sitting in the keyboard if I didn't think things were possible. When I got, a ch I was accepted at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. I got a chance to come to Denver, a thousand miles away from home. I had never been away from home, and we didn't have any money at all, and I came out here. I mean, it's all about risks. It's all about taking, and if you're a creative person, you cannot be creative without taking risks. Then you're going to be spinning your wheels. If you know what you're going to do before you do it, then don't do it because it's been done. Anyway, this is called Grandpa Goes to Heaven. It's not another one of my death pictures. Uh, I'm, not a f well, I'm not a fan of Sidney Sherman. I think she's a very talented photographer, but not the bloody genius. A gen g genius that everybody seems to think she is. She's been beating that dead horse for a long time. So I did myself as who is Sidney Sherman. <laughs> and I went through all the books, the, acad the academic books describing her uh, you know, philosophy and her highfalutin. And, 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 I, and these are practically quotes from the books. Uh, Sidney paints his fingernails shocking pink, a brilliantly audacious gesture that exposes the uh, discorroborative gender bias of Revlon's vacuity. Well, I'm going to see them translate this, <laughs> Revlon's vacuity, right. <laughs> uh, confirming <laughs> lethalic ploy, that I could understand, uh, of alpha males vis-a-vis -vis Derrida's strategies of discorroboration. Blah, 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 blah. I cannot say words over what, two syllables. Sidney <laughs> steals... Sidney Stills Wittgenstein's Tracticus Logico Philosophicus, a violently defiant act, not dissimilar in significance to that other revolutionary Luther stand at the church door at Wittenberg, thereby assaulting the capitalist paradigm of women as mere charge account chicks, and simultaneously demythifying Wittgenstein's relevance to 21st century epistemological discourse. <laughs> Sidney provocatively has a bad hair day, <laughs> displaying, displaying a visionary, almost mystical compulsion to redefine the sublimatory sublimatory vertical axis of the need for follicle correctness while refuting the illegitimate penetration of the warrior male's libidinous, flaccid, one-dimensionality as, as dialectical, homosexual, heterosexual, dysfunctional dysfunction. Alas, the signifier has lost his significance. And it, it oh, this is funny. <laughs> Sydney hitchhikes from Spring Street to Prince Street, photograph, photographically, uh, uh, I can't read it, photographically announcing a brazen freedom to be the antithesis of the Cartesian dictum, yes, no, or maybe, by asserting sympathy with Nietzsche's Ubermensch oder Uberschatzi. Uh, Sidney corroborates what phenomenologist 
Pope Maurice Pontificate has so succinctly declared, I am what I used to be. <laughs> and it goes on. <laughs> and the New York Times, uh, the day after, the day after Fourth of July, they asked five photographers on the editorial on the op-ed page to do something about where they thought the country was politically, and I did this. It's called Salvation, it's, and the first line is the most important line. It says, "No American has the right to impose his private morality on any other American, which is precisely the agenda of most organized religions," and that's the bottom line. Nobody has the right, especially self-righteous right, to tell you who you could sleep with, when you can have a baby, who you can love, and what you can eat on Friday nights. It's nobody's business. And I wish religious people, if they want to kill fatted cows and burn and whatever they want to do, just stay out of my face and mind your own fucking business. <laughs> oh. Boy, the, that Dwayne has a mouth on him, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh. This is my self-portrait as with feminine beard. <laughs> God, you people are disgusting. <laughs> this is called Things Are Queer, because this you have to understand, that all the logic we have has been human logic. It has nothing to do with the abs absolute nature of the way the world functions. And you're going to be so surprised when you die if there's no heaven and no hell. And because you put all of that in your head, according to Bet Tibetans, if you believe in heaven and hell, you're going to get pitchforks up like a zoo and all that kind of stuff because you're all sinners, so you're all going to Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh up the like kazoo. <laughs> no, that's heaven. Now, okay, this is called Things Are Queer. You see, I used to think of time as being horizontal. And if I looked straight ahead, I could make out the outlines of this coming weekend. And if I looked behind me, I could make out the outlines of last weekend. But now I can hardly make out the outlines of yesterday morning or tomorrow morning. But it's, guess when I was born? Remember I said there's no now when you say now? I was born now. And when I was in the Army, it was now. And when I was at DU, it was now. And now it's now. And guess when I'm going to die? I'm going to die now. But the minute you say it's now, it's not now. Our lives have been just one now, one, only one moment called now, which as a sequence we have stretched into this because of the nature of the rules of this particular universe. We have stretched into befores and afters. But if you examine it, there's never been anything else but now. And that's all there is. Can I go now? <laughs> it's called Christ in New York. Christ is sold on television by a religious hypocrite. God loves you. Oh, Jesus, I... This is Reverend, what's his name? You know, who's caught in a motel two or three times with a whore. Oh, Jesus, I have sinned against my Savior. Send money and I'll go... To, I, anybody, I don't like anybody who's professionally Irish, professionally religious, professionally anything, and, and, and professionally rich. Okay. Christ cries when he sees a young woman who has died during an illegal abortion. Christ eats dog food with an old Ukrainian lady in Brooklyn, in a country that spends, I don't know how many billions a moment, a minute, a minute, I mean, you know, we're shoveling that money out the window, uh, and yet we cannot, we have a, a F-35 or something that they spent how many billions on it and it doesn't fly after all that, and yet we cannot afford Obamacare, that's an abomination, if you cannot afford, if poor people in this country cannot afford to go to a hospital and not spend 10 goddamn bucks, 1,000 bucks, to have an appendix taken out or something. That's an abomination. We better get your priorities straight. Oh, I'm getting mad. <laughs> Christ is beaten defending a homosexual. I'll tell you the truth about it. You want to hear it? Homosexuality is just like heterosexuality, except it's different. Pe gay people are born gay, and straight people are born straight. Nobody makes any choices anywhere along the line. You suddenly, I dated all the way through high school. I dated Sue Mathis, and I dated, and, and here I, and I, I went with, uh, what's her name? The one with the big boobs. What was her name? 
See, I have some, I have some, I have some gay tra straight traits. No, but then I figured it out. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. And all these people spend their whole lives, oh my God, God hates me because my peepee's -pee pointing in the wrong direction. Ah! Get over it. <laughs> Christ, <laughs> I love what she did, get over it. <laughs> uh, Christ is, oh wait, oh. Oh, don't look, don't look. Christ sees a woman being attacked. You know what gets me about Muslims? Women are their mothers and their brothers. No, they're not their brothers. Well, sometimes. Women are their daughters and their sisters and their mothers and their wives and all of that. And they treat women like shit. Why is that that people treat women so badly? Why is it in this country? Why is it to get the, the act, the, what's that, equal, what's that anti-beat-up women act that just had to be renewed and the Republicans voted against it? What is, it's like, have, when, have you stopped beating your wife? It's the same thing, the same question. How could you be against, you know, a Violence Against Women Act? I think women should be really, really furious. I'm angry, and, and uh, it says gay anger. I mean, this is women's anger, but those <laughs> bitches get on your tail, you're dead. <laughs> Christ is killed by a mugger with a handgun, and the second coming had occurred, nobody noticed. You know, people who are marinated in religion, people who have no other references because it is written, and they never asked who wrote it and why it was it written. You know, you have to find out who you are, not who Jesus was. Who you are. And that's somebody else. The fallen angel. This is about, I call it irre irrevocable, irrevo see I have trouble with words over two syllables, irrevocable act. Like, once something happens, and it's, it's, you know, something, and you, don't, you can't go back. It's uh, friends of mine just got divorced, and just got separated. And it was one of those separations where he didn't know she was leaving, and he went to Europe and came back. She was gone with the dog and the money. But I'm, I, I don't know what went on, but his life has profoundly changed. There are certain moments. You lose your virginity, your life has changed. There are certain things. You, your heart is broken, your life has changed. You lose your job, your life has changed. And for me, this was about that moment when the, the guy arrives an angel and then he leaves, you know, real. This is called the most beautiful part of a man's body. This, I began to write with photographs because I was frustrated with the silence of still photography. The most, I think it must be there where the torso sits on and into the hips, those twin delineating curves, feminine in grace, girdling the trunk, guiding the eye downwards to their intersection, the point of pleasure. The most beautiful part of a woman's body, in the oldest dreams of old men, women's breasts still remain, long after their desire have turned, desires have turned to dust. They are their first memories, warm, nurturing home, the point of satisfaction. Perfect in their gracious arcs, women wear their breasts as medals, emblems of their love. All things mellow in the mind, a sleight of hand, a trick of time, and even our great love will fade, soon we'll be strangers in the grave. That's why this moment is so dear. I kiss your lips and we are here. So let's, uh, let's hold tight and touch and feel. For this quick instant, we are real. The New York Times asked me to do a self-portrait and I did a picture, who cares what I look like, but I did a picture of, of reading, because I'm a big reader, and I wrote, I think about thinking. And that's who I really am. So all these portraits of somebody are really about vanity and have nothing to do with the, what the person essentially is. And that's what this is about. If you could photograph what a person's about, not what they look like, that's a whole other thing. My father could walk on the sky, in the sky. He promised to teach me how, but he left without saying goodbye. I don't cry. I'm a grown-up now. Necessary things for making magic. You need a, a baby rat, a rabbit in a top hat, the scent of lilies of the valley, the last rose of summer, last year's jack in the pulpits, honey from a honey bee, uh, the blue of forget-me-nots, the amethyst dust, uh, and it goes on. Necessary things for writing fairy tunes. You need the hum of a hummingbird, a hummingbird's nest. No, the hum of a hum, yeah. The hum of a hummingbird's nest, the silence of mushrooms, the, the sound of wild columbines growing, uh, the buzz from a yellow jacket, and it goes on. The unfortunate man could not touch the one he loved. He, it had been declared illegal by the law. Slowly his fingers became toes and his hands gradually became feet. 
he began to wear shoes on his hands to disguise his pain. It never occurred to him to break the law. That's about people, gay people in the closet. You know, who let, don't let anybody define you. Don't, don't let a church define you. Don't let anybody define you. And me, women, don't let men define you, whatever. Because you have to define yourself. It's like the first things the Nazis did when they took power was to define Polish people as being subhuman, hum, uh, Jews as being subhuman. And the tragedy is when people believe the lies that have been laid on them, they actually believe, well, I must be stupid. No. Yes, you are if you believe the lies. So who defined you? Who defined you? Think about it. This is chance meeting. Ships in the night. Uh, I went to Pittsburgh to photo. I, I'm a big Pittsburgh fan. Don't ask me why. I have many <laughs> idiosyncrasies, and I, I don't know why I like Pittsburgh so much. And uh, when I went back, uh, uh, I said to my assistant, I had to photograph Larry Kramer for the New Yorker, and I, he's, I said, let's go back and see my old house. And our old house in McKeesport had fallen down, and poor McKeesport died. It was what, you know, talk about uh, uh, sending sh jobs overseas. McKeesport went belly up. Pittsburgh went belly up in 1978, 79. Nobody cried because all the, uh, the, the Japanese were dumping steel and the Chinese were dumping steel here. And, and, and So I went back, and... When I was there, the population, and that's where I was when I got the scholarship, was, uh, let's see, it was about 60,000. Now it's 14,000. And half the city's been decimated and empty. So we went back, and I arrived there when I had just turned 70, about two weeks later. And I looked, and I, I'll show you. I went into the room where I was born, and I felt I had come by a midwife, 1932. Everybody didn't go to the hospitals, and I had come complete, complete circle. So I went back, and I took photographs. Now, see, photographers love these old houses because they're photogenic, they're photographic, but they never knew who lived there. But I did, and I wrote about it. As, as me looking out my old bedroom window. As a child, I did not understand that I was a prince and that my father was the king. And although we did not live in a castle and father worked in the mill, I began to realize that in the realm of my dreams, I was the Dauphin. And through my bedroom window, I could see a spectacle of turrets and minarets float above the soil city below like an iridescent mist. My imagination would be both my wand and scepter, and there would be no boundaries to my domain. And it's true. And your mind and your imagination is both your wand and your scepter. It, oh, this is the room where I was, uh, today, where I was born. And that's the ghost picture. That's what it used to look like. And that's what, well, that's really what it looked like. In this very room on a February afternoon when Margaret was 20 and Jack was 23, I became to be. There's, here stood the bed where I first cried and mother bled, and above the bed a cross hung on the wall the day the midwife came to call. Over there, a chair near where the vanity used to be, its mirrors now scattered everywhere like shards of forgotten memories. My yesterdays are this debris, and I, alas, am 70. This is the old kitchen today. That's the ghost picture. And uh, that's me in the mirror. That's my mother on the, le on the uh, left. And uh, that's my grandmother. She died six months later. And that's my grandfather. He died uh, maybe a year or so later. This is the old dining room today. And uh, that's m my grandmother, they're dead, and my mother and father, and that's my brother Tim, and uh, that's his daughter, who, who I hope is in the audience. She lives in Columbine. Uh, that's my Tim and Anne, and that's m my two nieces. And I, I'll tell you what I know. Father lived incognito in his own house. He was a stranger to his spouse. Jack worked three shifts in Mr. Carnegie's mill for little pay and smoked three packs of camels every day. Camels were his best friends until they betrayed him in the end. Mother was a good man. Mother said he was a good man and a good provider. Between mother and me, he was always the outsider. When he was told that he had been cuckolded, father went from an amateur drinker to a professional, and mother took to her confessional. Once I saw him cry, I never thought to ask why. He was already a ghost when he died. 
it pains me to write this, he was not missed. Wow. That's terrible. That's a terrible thing to say, but I'll tell you what it is. It's real. It's true. It's no bullshit. It's not for any gallery. It's not for Sotheby's. It's not for MoMA. That's the stuff. That's the stuff. And if you're not going to do that, if you're not have the courage to write your own fucking truth, then, then sell shoes. <laughs> but I'm <laughs> pumped. That, oh, that, oh, oh, yeah, that's, that's, okay, I'll go back. That's, uh, fun, funnily enough, funnily, I don't say that often enough, funnily enough, uh, that chair was there. Mother did not love my father, she loved another. Margaret lived a secret melancholy. The life she chose to lead was her great folly. For you see, mother believed that she had sinned, and of course, Catholics don't divorce. You know what I don't get? I don't understand that. Why is it that God's only happy when we're miserable? Would have God really have been pissed if my mother had gotten divorced and been happy the rest of life? I don't think that's nice. That's not a nice God, if you ask me. Uh, McKeesport's on two rivers, the Monongahela and the Ogigeni. I threw a penny into the Ogigeni and made a wish that I might float with it down the Monongahela to the Allegheny, then further still, blow to the Ohio until I reached the Mississippi and the sea, and there I would, the tides would carry me away to where, I cannot say, some place fair and new, and I would do things that I had never had bef done before, and my penny wish came true. So I didn't go down, I came to Denver. I didn't go down there. <laughs> I, I, I'm almost done. Uh, uh, is it okay? Is it fine? Yeah. Uh, I love Hokusai and Hiroshige, and if you don't know anything about them, but you know too much about Andy Warhol, please, put Andy in the Campbell soup can and go and, and uh, look up, Hiro write this down, Hokusai Hiroshige. Uh, there was a wonderful thing at the turn of the century in France. There was something called Japonisme, and most people don't know about this, but it was a huge craze in things Japanese. Uh, Gauguin did 24 fan paintings, Degas, all the washerwomen and the, the prostitutes and all the, the real life, uh, the men working in the cotton exchange in, in uh, the laundress, uh, that's washerwomen. Uh, that's right out of Yukioi. Yukioi was the Japanese art of photographing real life, daily life. Uh, Toulouse Lautrec dressed himself up in a Japanese costume. All the posters are right out of a Japanese paint. All the flat paintings that Matisse and everybody did, all the flatness comes out of Japanese prints. They called Bonar the Japanese nabi. It was a huge influence, and these photographs, are, these prints are stunning. You know too much about photography, you know, no, but look up the Japanese. They're wonderful. So I began to do fan-shaped photo. Now this is, Fred and I live in New York, but we also have a house in the country uh, for 70, we're, we want to be in the middle of Manhattan. We want to be in the middle of the woods. We are not hip. We are not cool. I am not hip, certainly. I'm, not, I'm vulgar and I'm not cool, but what I really am is I'm charming. <laughs> and it will take 30, let's see, it would take, I'm 80, it would take tw uh, four 20-year-olds and one one-year-old hipster to equal me, have my energy. It would take 10 80-year-olds and two half-year-olds to hip equal my energy and my savoir faire. <laughs> anyway, so this is the garden. Uh, it's, it's the colors of my garden in the four seasons, so that's winter, spring. I have a better spring picture. Our cherry blossoms are out. That's summer, and that's fall. I love, uh, I love uh, Vuillard, and, and this is a painting. Uh, uh, this is Lux Comme et Volupte comes from a painting that Matisse did, and he got it from uh, Baudelaire. It's my translation being luxury, serenity, and voluptuousness. And I love those patterns which I got out of uh, Bouillard. If you don't know any of that, start looking it up. Uh, the, this is about, oh yeah, here it is. Uh, the besotted rake, asleep by the cascading stream, dreams, uh, uh, drunken dreams of the lovers he will make. I love the idea that he's so drunk, even his dreams are drunk. I think that's very funny to have drunk. Have you ever had a drunk dream? Have you ever dreamt you were drunk in a dream? Okay. Uh, Vince, uh, Vincent van Gogh carried a ladder into a field of sunflowers, leaned it against the cloud, and climbed to heaven. Uh, this is about rain. 
Suddenly a summer shower, I am watered like a flower. I don't regret being wet because I blossom for an hour. And, oh, there's a quote from, I love Shakespeare. God, what a, I mean, he knocks me out entirely. I mean, you know, and, and he, did, he did do like, you know, up your ass and down, uh, you know. <laughs> I'm trying to think of say, some Shakespearean words, you know. No, I mean, you know, talk about language. The French, it's called bombo. When something is really, really well said, that is so elegant. And here, and here he said, to part the, to, to, to fan the embers from his sleeping eye. No, that's not right. Is that right? Moonbeams. Moon Give that man a dollar. To, he fa he, to, to, to fan the moonbeams, and I'm doing fan-shaped pictures. Get it? Oh, forget it. <laughs> and then I wrote, on a moonlit night such as this, bottom and Titiana first shared an enchanted kiss. I, Midsummer Night's Dream. Do you know that Mendelssohn wrote Midsummer's Night's Dream when he was 17? Have you ever heard that music? Oh, you know much too much about. What's that woman's name? She's, all, she's young, and she's always breaking up with a boyfriend so she could write music. Taylor Swift. <laughs> I looked at the kids, the kids. What's wrong with, I don't know, maybe she's not there anymore. Oh, we have these nasty geese down the road and they block your car. And if you try to get out of the car, they bite you. They're really mean. Uh, luckily, one of them was hit by a car, there were only two left. So <laughs> we're going down the road, they were blocking the car. And we're sitting in the car and Fred, you get out and chase the geese. I'm not getting out, you get out and chase the geese. And luckily, a car came behind us, and as they were charging to attack the next car, I got the shot. <laughs> oh, these are morning glories. I love morning glories. Uh, what happened with morning glories, you know, they're really rude. They slam shut. I, I was in town, and this lady had a whole thing with morning glories, and so I said, could I, I want to photograph them. So I, I snipped, it's a fifth, when we got home, they were all dead. They slammed shut. And so I thought, I'll out with them. I will plant the morning glories in a pot, in the house, and then when they fly, I will then run out with them and not take them out of the pot. And then I liked that so much, I planted a vine of morning glories, which climbed up all over, the, anyway. See, I, I, get, I, I, I have a lot of fun. <laughs> there, that's a Hiroshige print. Uh, the spirit of my mother's, my spirit of my mother was happy when she saw me photographing her roses. The Japanese did a real lot about ghosts. They, they had a real, they believed in ghosts, and they did lots and lots of, I saw two ghosts. I saw a ghost in our house one night, and, and then I saw my mother's ghost after she died. It really interesting. What does that say? What about out of body? What does that say about other dimensions of the possibilities, our mind stuff, our mind energy? It's all there, it's a mind energy. I use friends of mine. Magnus was burned by Solange's fiery mane, singed by a lick of flame. Mm. Singe, lick, hmm. <laughs> Odette, Odette hair flowed into a seashell and spilled, Undine, and spilled into her, uh, its edges like ponds of, pa pond, uh, pools of tresses. Undine is a story about a sea nymph, uh, Giraudot, I think, made a play of it, about a sea nymph who comes out of the water and falls in love with a human, and because she's a sea nymph, she dies. The, in the season of their passion, Re uh, reason surrend to, surrendered to desire. See, I, I did that in uh, 06. That's how old that is. And I did some still lifes, still more still lifes. A shimmering light like quick silver glowing, a halo of white flower. Uh, uh, there's, I'll go through the rest very quickly because I'm, I think I'm, I want to get some questions. Oh, the startled cat sees the ghost of his dead master. Okay, that's it. Oh, no, we'll have questions and answers, okay? I ask you questions and you give me answers. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, yes, doctor, I have a doctor up front. Yes, oh, I know. yes, you, that would be you. Okay, uh, I guess the most basic question, why photography? Uh, why not? <laughs> was, it, was it your first choice? No, well, I, I was always interested in the arts. I always, you see, there are those people who have, I said, I had an aesthetic itch. There are people who are natural. You know, a guy, at five years old, the kid's throwing a ball. He can't miss. He's on a baseball team when he's a teenager. He's a football. There are naturals. There are people who have, uh, I admire people who have uh, uh, minds for physics. 
these people are really brilliant. You know, they figure out the bow. They've, they've got these incredible, but they're naturals. You have to, their minds come in different kind of flavors. There are people who are actresses, and they're, you know, Shakespeare, that's people who are natural writers. And each of us have different kinds of minds. I had an aesthetic itch. I didn't know what it, I'm painting now with photographs. I'm come com, complete circle. Yeah, so it, uh, it was what I, they were my instinct. You have to find, you know what, uh, Bill Moyer did this one wonderful series on public television about, uh, he said, find your, fi it was with Joseph Campbell. Campbell said, find your bliss, find your thing, find that, th that thing. And I found that thing. And I'm very lucky because I, I'm very verbal. And my father was, uh, my, my mother always said that what I really inherited was my, my, my dad's, what's that, something of gab, gift of gab. My dad had the gift of gab. And uh, well, she certainly sold, he certainly sold over. Uh, anyway. uh, so uh, I, I do, do what that thing is. If you like to make pie, so then be the best pie maker in the entire world. I love doing what I've never done. There's a wonderful book you should read. I don't care if you read it, but if you want to read it. It's called Zen Mind and Beginner's Mind. When you're a beginner, you pay great attention. See, photographers who spend their whole lives walking around looking for something to take a picture of, what they're seeing is what John Zarkowski or, or uh, Robert Frank told them it's okay to see. They're so marinated in the history of photography that they, they can't see anything without all of these references. Diane, a freak, Diane Arbus, parking lot, blah, blah, blah. So uh, the thing is that you have to, when you bake a cake, you get a cup and it says one cup of flour and you go one cup of flour, one teaspoon of one, you know, and one, and then two drops of two. But when you do it all, you oh, a cup of, you're like Julia Child, you oh, just a little alcohol, you say a little <laughs> da dash of wine, one for the pot, you know. But so it's that, you know, so that's why I never do the same thing. I've done books on every, I did a book on Egypt. I did a children's book. I've, you know, I did a book on quantum in Germany. I, I d I've done lots and lots of different things because I'm always, the first time you do it, it's the best time. You know, wow, look what I could do. That's fantastic. So always be the beginner. Never grow up because if you grow up, you, be, you become a habit. Once your life becomes a habit, you, you know, it's a habit. You do what all habits are. Well, it's Thursday. I guess we're going to fuck tonight, Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've got a mouth that won't stop. You know. Okay. Uh, any, uh, anyway, question, yes, way in the back. Stand up, I can't see you. Have you always shot in film, or have you switched to digital as times have progressed? Shot what? Never mind. Uh, <laughs> if I'm bad, the audience is worse. No, I've always, I don't do digital. I'm, I have two cameras, and uh, I just bought a computer. I had one. I never used it for 10 years, and I, had, I needed a computer. So I took it out of the box, I, and it didn't work, and I gave it to the cleaning lady. She gave it back. <laughs> she said, this thing doesn't work. It's out of date. You know? <laughs> anyway, no, I, and, I, and I'm my, ca my two cameras, here's what I have. I have two cameras. I don't know how to use strobe. Uh, I don't, but I did work on a computer with, oh, I, I, I guess I didn't show you. Oh, do you want to see the computer things? Do I, have, I, I want to, you know, okay, I'll, I'll, I think they're on there. I'll show you the computer stuff, but I'll go through quickly, because it's really quite, oh, they took it off. Click the exit, that means it's gone. Okay, no, it's not there, I, okay. I, oh, I told them not to, okay. Uh, any other, oh, what was your question? <laughs> oh, about, about, no. You know, it really doesn't matter what you use. Uh, it really doesn't. Uh, it's what you do with what you use. You, oh, you want all this stuff and clicking. And all, there's a wonderful story about Thoreau. Thoreau, at Ma when he was at Walden Pond. Oh, Thoreau, when he was at Walden Pond. Uh, don't look at the picture. Look at me. <laughs> Can you turn that off? They're going to look at me. I, I, should, I should be backlit. And this is a very bad light for a bald guy. Uh, no. <laughs> Th picture this, throws a Walden Pond. Somebody comes to Walden Pond and says, have you heard the big news? You can now send a telegram all the way from Boston to Texas and throw, that was the great, you know, uh, technical t breakthrough. And Thoreau said, that's amazing. But does Boston have anything to say to Texas? <laughs> and that's the point. Everybody's clicking and tweetering and farting and things and, yeah. Okay, next question. I was, yes. I was wondering if you had any regrets about coming here, yeah, well, a besides, lot. Besides <laughs> coming here. <laughs> no, I, no, I don't have, no, I, this is strange. This, yeah, there, 
maybe, but no, I don't know. Because I, you, when you look back on something and you made a choice, you made the best possible choice that you could, that, that you were capable of. And then, you know, Monday, Monday quarterbacking or, you know, I, sh mm, I should have taken the road less traveled, you know. <laughs> uh, that's funny, isn't it? She, she laughed. Uh, if only one person laughs, I don't care. Uh, no, I, regrets are really, no, the answer is no. It's wasted energy, you know. Just don't do it again. <laughs> you know, you, I've got a billion dollar brain full of thousands of synapses. Yes, doctor, there's another doctor back there, a lady doctor, yes. <laughs> I'm giving you free doctorates, <laughs> and you don't want to take it. Okay, what? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was lucky enough to um, find out about you a few days ago. Uh -oh. I didn't know you existed before. Are you a stalker? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, but I might be on my way. <laughs> and I find myself... Um, being constantly amazed by things as, as I yeah. grow older and mad that I didn't know about it when I was younger. And I was wondering if there is anything as of late that has totally amazed you and you were shocked you didn't know. Well, shocked. Uh, I know everything, so it's sho <laughs> I'd be pleased. I mean, that's got to be pretty shocking. <laughs> it's got to shock me. Uh, no, I'm al there's always some little thing. Uh, today, coming on the planet, I'll tell you my thing, I, I'm, I like to read. My best read is the New York Review of Books. I have learned about so many things I never knew anything about, obscure poets, all kinds of things. So I'm open 24-7. I mean, I'm, you know, the idea, when you get out of college, uh, high school, you think, well, I'm graduated, I have my diploma, you know, and that's it. I, I haven't read a book in the last 20 years. No, that's why it's called commencement, your beginning. The habits, but the most important thing about being is you develop the habits that are going to ca carry you the rest of your life. And if you're going to have a habit like, well, I, I could do it tomorrow, or, you know, I'll just have two more brewskis, and no, I have four more brewskis. <laughs> Why am I looking at you when I'm saying that? This is bizarre. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. I, I do that. I talk, you know, I look at you, you know, I mean, anyway. No, but it's your habits. And see, I, I've never needed an assignment. I've always been very self-motivated. I never, if you need somebody to give you an assignment, when you walk out of the door of this institution and nobody's there, you're out of business. And I gave the, what was that? I gave the gradu graduation thing at the new school. And I asked the student how much, what the, they graduate owing $200,000. I couldn't believe it. They're indentured servants. And you know what they graduated with? A port they graduated with a portfolio of 100 pictures of their girlfriend's ass. <laughs> that's, that's their thesis. Wow, there's no surprise there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> and that train left the station. <laughs> oh, any other questions? Hi. Oh, I hear voices again. I'm right oh, here. Okay. I, I had a question, and was it harder to come out as a homosexual or as a photographer to your parents? I'm not gay. Where did you, how rude is that? <laughs> I've been checking out her tits all along, and now you're telling me I'm gay. Uh, did I come this far to get insulted? No, no, well, of course it's difficult, especially my generation. You know, you're brought up, you don't want to be, you, know, you don't want to be a sissy, you know. Nobody wants to be a sissy, and I know you, you're in the audience. <laughs> Takes one to know one. <laughs> no, 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 but you know what, I, you know why I work? Because I'm true to myself, you know, and it takes a long time. If you creationists out there, you're wrong. It is evolutionary. And uh, in this process of, we evolve as people. You know, if you're still, my mother believed every lie of the Catholic Church when she was a little girl. And there she was, I was with her when she died. And, <coughs> and she, w she was going and, and, and I thought, have you ever read Tibetan Book of the Dead? Put down the Bible, read Tibetan Book of the Dead. So I, and in Tibetan Book of the Dead, you're supposed to do this ritual to, to Prepare. See, you take your mind. Here's what it is. I don't know. Maybe it is. I don't know. Here's what it is. Your, your mind your mind stuff. Everything is your mind stuff. And when you die, the mind energy continues. It evaporates. It leaves my Duane's <coughs> Duane dead. But, <coughs> well, there it goes. <coughs> it's the mind stuff. And so you, the mind stuff continues. And nothing in our culture p p prepares us to, I'm stuttering. I'm so excited. Nothing in my mind, our mind prepares us for this, so suddenly you find yourself in this other situation. But if you tell people in this process, if you tell them about the, the Bardos uh, and what they happened, uh, it prepares them. So I did my version 
And I know my mother's, you know, she's half, half dead thinking, what the fuck is he talking about? Where's the priest? I want extreme unction. I'll be lying here, you know, and I'm talking about all this. And I did see her ghost later, and she went like this at me, you know. No, she didn't. <laughs> anyway, uh, I forgot what that was about. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, evolving and all that stuff. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I used this, somebody reminded me of it. I forgot about it. You know what it's like? It's like being a trapeze artist. Here's the idea. I forgot all about it, thank you. Here's, the idea, here's something, I was brought up a Catholic and I believed all this stuff and all that nonsense and heaven and hell and blah, blah, blah. And it's like you're swinging, okay, that's your set of beliefs. And then suddenly you become aware of other beliefs and like all trapeze artists, it takes a leap of faith to let go of this belief and grab onto the new bar. So when you have the courage to let go, for a minute you're in midair and then you grab onto the next thing. So it's letting go and unlearning is the hardest. You are not whatever you think you are. I'm absolutely sure, especially you young people. Well, not you. You are what you think you are. No, no. But, but especially, no, you know, oh, my God, there's a little girl here. Has she sat through this whole diatribe? Oh, you're going to hell, sister. <laughs> no, you're not. I just made that up. Uh, Okay, no, it, it's, and I'm not done, I'm not done. I'm quite willing to latch on to, to let go. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, hi. Um, I really enjoyed the photos uh, with the fan mm -hmm. images. Those yeah. are very beautiful. And I was just wondering, um, since you work strictly in film, how did you create that process with the fan itself, the shape of the fan? Oh, that's interesting. I met this wonderful guy on a computer. He's Chinese, he's fantastic. Oh, I want to tell you, in China, red is the color of good luck. See, you're, you're a very lucky guy. He's got a red shirt on a red seat and he's got a red ass. <laughs> Terrific. You're a, baboons are very lucky. What's that? <laughs> I, you're, you're referring to your nose, right. Anyway, uh, uh, and he's a whiz on the computer and I tell him what I want to do. We've done really amazing things. I did a whole new series. It's called this, this, this Deconstructed Photograph, where I take a picture I take it apart and reconstruct in a whole new way. They're really, really beautiful. And we're going to show them this fall. Uh, anyway, uh, what was the question? <laughs> no. I was wondering the process. Oh, the process. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, I think of an idea, and if I, I get so excited, see, I, you know, see how skinny I am? I generate my own energy. Or do you want to hear the secret to being beautiful? I get this all the time. Why are you so beautiful? Why are you so beautiful? <laughs> I don't need chocolate. And then you, you don't need chocolate, you couldn't be as beautiful as I am. But uh, the process is uh, I come up with an idea, and I think that's a great idea, and I'm so anxious to, if I think it on Monday, I'll have it done by Friday. And it's that, that's the great moment is when I think of the idea. And then it's when I see it's great, and then when it's published, that's nice too. But it's that moment of conception, wow, that's a great idea. And I really can't wait to see it. Any more questions? And, and yes, Doc. One more here. That's you. I call everybody doctor. What are your pet peeves? You. I find you very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> your favorite pet peeves. And well, I like pets, so I don't have any pet peeves. Uh, you see, I, I tend to hear, again, to he pet peeve. I know what he means, but I'm thinking of pets. I have a pet. I like to pet. When I was in high school, I petted. Mostly with myself. At any rate, okay. <laughs> now, in the entire history of the universe, as I said at the beginning of this spiel, um, uh, I'll never see you again, and in that now that's not now, but soon to be a ma motion major picture, we are here now, so this is your last chance to ask any questions right now. Okay, we have somebody way in the back in the dark. Okay. Well, well, we, let's, let's Actually, we're recording, so if you can wait for the mic. Yep. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll get to you. The guy Sorry, with his finger in his nose. Yeah, you. Okay. Do you have any favorite memories uh, of Denver in the 50s? Yeah, it was Denver. I love Denver. Denver was such a small town. And my and we, first time I ever flew, we flew from Pittsburgh, whoa, on Continental Airlines to uh, TWA to St. Louis. See things you remember? And we got here when it was a cloudy day at Stapleton. And I thought, where are the clouds? I mean, where are the mountains? I came from mountains. <laughs> where are the mountains? They lured me, and there are no mountains. And my first year was awful. I was so homesick. I was so homesick, and I didn't know anybody. And, and I just, but the second year, I started taking an art course. Uh, I'm, I, I, could, I, I could teach in the Denver public school system. I, I, took, I, I got a degree in art education. 
And uh, so the second year, I, there were four great friends, Bill, Mel, and Roy. And uh, Mel died this year. And I hope Bill's in the audience. He lives in Colorado Springs. And uh, burp, if Bill, if you're out there, burp. <laughs> he had a real burping and digestion problem. No. <laughs> and, and then the more I stayed, uh, you know, I, it was, it, it was it, coming here is when we came down by Washington Park and we drove by, all those places still had that flavor. It was like my Madeleine, like Proust Madeleine. That all of that's, do you know that the DNF Tower was the tallest building in Denver when I got here? And they tore down that building and put up a parking lot. You know the song, Young People? <laughs> See, I keep referring to young people. Yeah. No, uh, I have a very sweet, tender, but I won't write a poem about Denver. <laughs> Pittsburgh is easier to rhyme. Okay. And somebody else? Yeah. I, I was just wondering what sparked your interest in Japanese art like Hokusai? Well, because I'm into, you know, it's beautiful. I mean, it's just, it's really, really beautiful. It's a vocabulary, it's a vocabulary that we don't have. And once you, like when I first came to New York, I hated Takiriko. No, I loved Takiriko. I photographed myself with Takiriko. My th big heroes were Takiriko, Baltus, and Magritte, and I photographed all of them, which was really terrific. And when I first st saw Takiriko's work, I thought, what the hell's that? That's, that's, yeah, he can't even draw. And then little by little, I, see, artists, really good ones, not Andy Warhol, but really good artists. <laughs> he's not a good artist, he's a terrible artist. Uh, really good, he's a, he's a f cultural phenomenon, but he's a terrible artist. Uh, I knew Andy, so I can say that. Uh, you want to hear a conversation with Andy? Andy was the most boring person. <laughs> talking to Andy was like talking to a telephone off the hook. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, it's true. Ring, ring, ring. Hello. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, hi, Andy. Uh, uh, uh. Hi, Dwayne. Uh, uh, uh. What's new, Dwayne? Uh, 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 uh. Anyway, no. I got so. F I thought that was so funny. I forgot what I was talking about again. <laughs> what was your question? What? Oh, yes, because it's beautiful. I mean, it's beautiful. So then I had to learn how to, you know, not speak Japanese, but, you know. And the more nuance. You see, Andy Warhol is very popular because who doesn't know uh, Marilyn Monroe? Who doesn't know? He just dipped into the cultural and used other people's photographs. And Joan Malanga did all the stencils. He didn't do anything but had his picture taken with celebrities. And then he became, you know, I, I spent a lot of time, I photographed Truman Capote often, and, I, and he hated Andy Warhol. He felt Andy Warhol was a real poseur. Andy tried to cultivate him. And the irony is now Andy's more famous than Truman Capote is. But, that, but I digress. Okay. See, I keep thinking I'm, I'm uh, what's his name? Jack Benny. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, you. Yeah. Oh, oh. You talked in the beginning about uh, wanting to go out and have adventures, and yes. I, I'm sure you, it looks like you've had some, some great adventures. Oh, I had lovely adventures. Uh, can you speak maybe about your favorite or the most memorable? No, but there, there you know, I, I, Esquire sent me to Alaska to photograph Eskimos, and I spent, I got stuck in an island in the Bering Sea in November in a snowstorm, and, and I couldn't get my ass out of there. It was awful. And that was an adventure I don't want to have again. And Army was certainly an adventure. I got a commission in quartermaster. They put me in tanks during the Korean War. I had never seen a tank in my life. I was 21 going on 12 still. And I, luckily, I went to Germany. I just did a book about it. It was called, see, I've been able to use everything in my life. When I was, I'm really running long. Is this OK? Is that all right? OK. Uh, when, I was, uh, uh, when I was in the Army, I had two great bodies of correspondence. One was with Helen McDonald, my, my, my pretend girlfriend, and the other was with Dick McFadden. I knew a lot of Scottish people, for, and he keeps saying we all day, and he's not even French. No, but uh, he means small, we, yeah. Anyway, and so uh, you live off of your, and Dick McFadden was my gay guru from McKeesport. He'd already been uh, to uh, Pitt, uh, New York once. So uh, fast forward 50 years. Yeah, 50 years. Uh, and I got a package in the mail uh, from Dick McFadden, and he said, I saved all your letters, and I thought you might want to read them. And I said, well, that's funny. I put it Two years later, I got a package from Helen saying, I saved all your letters, and I thought you might want to read them. Two years ago, I found going through debris, I thought I should shred these old things, and then I began to read them, and that whole 
trauma and the Army was the worst time of my life. That's what I measure rotten. Everybody has in their life something they measure rotten against. Maybe it was your cancer, maybe it was somebody leaving you, whatever it is. The Army was the worst time of my life. And um, so I published a book. Uh, it, it's called the, the Lieutenant Who Loved His Platoon. And it was all about everything that happened. And, and, uh, and uh, it died on, it never got, it was published, but even the gay people didn't read it. But it's a, it's, it's, it's a wonderful book. Yeah, it's wonderful. Okay. Oh, was that, you asked me that? That was the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, they're all doctors. That was your question. No, you forgot, didn't you? No, I didn't. Oh, she's, she's so easy to intimidate. Watch this. <laughs> Dwayne, uh, yeah. I'll, be, I'll be the last question okay. here. And I just want to, and right here, I Dwayne, over here. Dwayne, Dwayne, Dwayne. Uh, right here. Oh, you. Me. No, there's, there's somebody back there waiting, too. Uh, okay. I just wanted to thank you for your generosity your, your life insights, and I've been designated by the audience to actually give you a big hug. <laughs> what? Oh. I only do it for the hugs. And what was your question? Well, I can't really follow that. So, yeah. um. Force yourself, my dear, force <laughs> yourself. Okay, um, you talked about the uh, Heisenberg photo that you did for yeah. French Vogue. Were mm -hmm. there any other notable assignments that you did for Vogue or fashion magazines? Oh yeah, I did the Paris collections for uh, Vogue. I did the I did I did a comic strip for a magazine called Grace Mir uh, no, Mirabella, and it was very funny. We did three episodes. It was about a fictitious woman like Holly Golightly named Pret Porter, and we did one of the episodes where Pret goes to Paris. And she is sent there. I made up the stories and did the whole thing. She's sent to Paris to, uh, because she sh the opening picture is, it's like a comic strip, and it's, you know, the whole thing. And she's talking to Ungaro, and Spy, the gossip magazine, had dispatched uh, uh, somebody to go to the, to sneak, had dispatched the spy to go to the collections and to discredit the collections. So they wanted Pret to go underground and find out who the spy from Sneak was. And that was a wonderful story. We photographed in Coco Chanel's apartment, and it turned out to be the Polly, the makeup lady. I'm doing an assignment now, I'll tell you. This is the last thing, and I'll shut up. Uh, I, I'm doing an assignment for Valentino, and it's very funny because I often get to ask stories for, uh, uh, I, I, I like, I don't care about fashion, but I like anything that gives me a giggle. And fashion can get very, very funny. But, and if you ever listen to the, the language, it is really like, that is so divine. Oh, I'll tell you one bad thing. Anytime you want me to say, I, you know, I can go on for days. I'm very opinionated. No, but what happened was I did this Heisenberg thing, and I did that whole thing for Quantum, and the editor from Vogue calls up, and she said, Duane, we think your work was pure genius. So I hung up, and I said, Fred, French Vogue thinks uh, my work is pure genius. <sighs> and so a month later, I'm talking to somebody, and I said, I never use the word cool. I never say cool. That, that's the word that every, the, uh, you know, whatever. And I said, when I was growing up, the word was neat. Everything is so neat. And then I said, in England, the word that everybody uses is brilliant. And then he had the hell of a nerve to say to me, and in Paris, everything is genius. <laughs> oh, you wicked child. I'm melting. <laughs> I'm not a genius. Uh, uh. Anyway, so I, but I'll tell you this last thing, okay? Um, I'm getting paid by the word. Uh, Val, uh, Valent, uh, Valentino's retired, and what they've done is the two people who work for him have taken over the collection. Apparently, they're very good. And they're doing a book, and they did the accessories and shoes, so they're doing a big book of the collection. So they asked. Uh, s certain photographers to do different, you know, they give you like 10 pages to do something. So they're giving me handbags. So I'm doing uh, 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 this beautiful girl, woman, uh, playing strip poker with this guy. And, and she keeps having to take her clothes off. And then she, when, she, when her breasts are so, she picks up the big bag and she covers up her tits so you can't see that. And then when she keeps losing, then she gets the little bag and she holds it down here. And then the last picture is shooting over the back of the of the woman, and you see the guy holding both handbags. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> oh, okay. Uh. Thank you. What? I want to know what you said. You didn't like Superior Co at first.
works and then you yeah, started yeah. to like it. Why do you think that it because I grew to, because the Kiriko was a brilliant art, only the first, no, no, uh, because, because he had a very private, I'm only talking about up to 1920, the rest of his garbage, but up till then he was really great, and he had his own vocabulary. See, all great art, you have to come to them, you have to learn how to, you don't have to go anywhere to go to Andy, I mean Andy's in public domain, everything he does is out of the public domain, but to Kiriko, there's no two to Kirikos. there are plenty of Andys, but no two to Kirikos. and with a really great person, you look at that and you think, nobody else has that private sensibility, that is so unique, that is so wonderful, he invites you to enter his world, so I had, I entered de Kiriko's world. Right, okay. Thank you. Applause, 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 thank you. I've never ran on so much.